you know, I had to search and uh, bring in the cheese. Mm -hmm. My sister used to think it was bringing in the cheese. She was wondering, <laughs> she was wondering when the old plate with cheese was going to be passed around. It never happened. Kind of confused there, Lori. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we like to encourage people to share the good news of Christ with mm -hmm. other folks. And uh, there's a lot of ways that you can do that through tracks and, mm -hmm. and uh, just relationships with people and inviting the church, uh, telling your testimony about what God's done for you and so on. Well, there was this, uh, <clears throat> this barber who was a Christian and he, he kind of got a conviction about the fact that he hadn't been sharing the gospel with his clients, uh, his customers, and so... He, he just said, Lord, tomorrow, the first customer I have, I'm going to share the gospel with him. And so, next day came, first customer comes in, says, I want a haircut and a shave. And he said, just a minute, I'll be right back. So the barber went to the back, and he's um, getting stuff together. And he stopped and he prayed, Lord, help, help me to do a good job of sharing your word this morning. And... Uh, so then he came out from the back. He's a little nervous, you know. Came out from the back, he had a Bible in one hand and a straight razor in the other, and he said, Are you prepared to die? <laughs> <laughs> and you do, you do need to think these things out. <laughs> think these things out before you jump in there. Don't, don't be afraid to jump in there, but <clears throat> you might not want to scare them to death in the, in the process. <clears throat> All right, then. Well, did the change of the time bother anybody? I think it did bother you. Yes. <laughs> when, I, when I was a, oh, a little, little boy, probably seven or eight, I remember very vividly, we went to church, and I have to admit that that wasn't my favorite thing to do in those days. <laughs> and uh, we got there, and they're doing the closing prayer. It was one of the happiest days of my life. <laughs> it changed the time. Yeah. That's awful, isn't it? But anyway, that's how it was back in those days. <clears throat> so I was, you know, all dressed up and everything, and no place to go but home. <laughs> all right, let's let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we uh, we understand that. A whole lot of people out there, like we were talking about in Sunday school, they don't get it <coughs> because they never got it. They never, never got you. They never came to know you. And I know when I was a little boy, I didn't know you, and and uh, that's why I didn't think too much of going to church. Kind of boring. Lord, I, I beg of you to uh, draw folks to you, help them to see that they need you. Help them to see that sin is, is just waiting to take charge of their lives. And uh, Father, we we adore you only because you loved us first. And uh, we need to be be prepared as a, a little story about the barber. We need to be prepared to to leave this world. To physically die, which is only sleep for a Christian, and be ready, ready to go when the time comes. Father, the, this is a a world that is going the other way, and you know that much better than I do. But Lord, I pray that you'll bring what you can only bring that that revival, that spirit of conviction, that need for Christ. Lord, we, we ask you this morning to do that in our lives, in this church, in this community. And Lord, we'll give you the praise for it. Bless those that are sick, help them. Bless those especially that are sin sick. Bless those that are grieving. Lord, we need your mercy, we need your grace. And take charge of this service. May our praises be pleasing to your ears. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Let's sing.
sing his praises.
begin by reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Beginning with verse 23. <clears throat> For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. Let's just spend a few moments examining our own hearts and asking the Lord to cleanse us from anything that would interfere with our relationship with Him. <clears throat> All of you are welcome to receive the Lord's Supper with us if you know Him as your Lord and Savior, uh, whether or not you are members of this particular church.
my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
leave any room for this stuff. Forgiveness, to excuse a fault, absolve from payment, pardon, send away, cancel, and bestow favor unconditionally. Forgiveness. Forgive the big hurts and the little hurts. Forgive that person who hurt you in the biggest way you've ever been hurt, maybe years ago. Forgive the person that stepped on your toe in the grocery store yesterday. Forgiveness is to be complete. And I remind you that it is for your own good. It is primarily for your own good that you forgive. That you must forgive. That we must forgive. Often the things that we hold against somebody are imagined. Sometimes we don't even have any reason to be angry and bitter, but in our own minds we think it's so. But what if it's totally true and they did us wrong in the most horrible way that you can imagine being done wrong? You and I are the only ones who are going to, in the end, suffer for holding on to it be poisoned by the root of bitterness. Bitterness means poison uh, in the Hebrew culture. When we fail to forgive, it's, it's like the worst torture that the Roman Empire ever used. And that was the torture where they would strap a dead body to your back and you would carry that maggot-filled dead body around with you for weeks. And the poison of, of the putrefaction and all that would eventually seep into your body and slowly make you sick and kill you. Just the stench would be beyond imagination. Well, that's what it's like when we carry bitterness and even hatred, unforgiveness around with us. We're carrying like this rotten stench that is poisoning us every single day. It's not worth it to carry that junk around with you. It's real. And it's really happening in people's lives every day. It's not doing any good. It's not hurting the person that they're hating. <clears throat> that, that person's just fine. And sleeping like a baby. God's going to deal with them. And we need to realize that. We need to just leave it in God's hands for him to deal with them. Well, a fellow named Cain had a problem with this way back. He's, fa he's famous for being the first murderer. In Genesis chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel's offering. Respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance <coughs> fell. Most people, it's very difficult to hide the fact that you're angry. And it's like, you know, <laughs> your face contorts. He just, it's hard to hide. His countenance fell, and the Lord said to Cain, Why are you so angry? Why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, you will not, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, Sin lies at the door. Its desires for you, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that 
Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. The first murder, because of anger and animosity, envy, hatred, Cain did not do well. He didn't do well in his offering. And he's like, well, what was wrong with his offering? Uh, I mean, he was a farmer. Uh, he tilled the soil. He planted vegetables. He harvested them. And he brought an offering of what he did in his daily life to the Lord. So he's like, well, that's kind of bad that God didn't accept his offering. Well, that's probably what he thought. And, uh, and then Abel's offering was accepted. He was a shepherd. He kept the sheep. And so he brought one of the products of his work as an offering. So that just makes sense. However, I think that, uh, well, first of all, some people say it's because Cain's offering was vegetable and Abel's offering was animal. And, uh, and we know the sacrificial system took uh, much of the Old Testament. And you had people offering animals and their blood as a picture of the ultimate offering of Christ. And, and even, you know, Abraham was told by God to take Isaac and offer him. And, and then he, uh, God provided a substitute offering in the, in the form of a bullet that was caught in the brush. brush and, and, uh, but here, we don't have any knowledge that Adam and Eve or their descendants had ever been told at this point that they were supposed to bring a blood offering, an animal offering to God. Now maybe, maybe he told them that, but if he told them that, he didn't tell us that he told them that. And so as far as we know, uh, they had not yet been commanded to do that. Abraham was commanded to take Isaac up there and do an offering. But they weren't commanded. So I don't, I don't see where we can, um, with confidence, say that it was because it was uh, a vegetable instead of uh, an animal that was brought as an offering. But I think you can see from just what is said here about their offerings, that there's a difference. It says that Cain, in verse 3, Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. And Abel brought of the firstborn and of the fat. Abel brought the first and the best. And Cain brought some vegetables. You know, I think you can easily understand that from what is said there. And yeah, you you have to bring, we're supposed to bring God our best, not our leftovers. Are you bringing God your best or what's left over after you get done with it? The first and the best. That's the whole idea of, of the tithe <clears throat> is that it's you take your income and the first tenth of it, you give back to the Lord as a symbol of your devotion to Him, your trust in Him, your faith in Him, your love for Him, and your belief that He will take care of you. And so, the first and the best is always the concept when it comes to offerings that are given to God. And, uh, but you know, there's, there's another statement that is made later in the Bible that kind of summarizes what the difference between these two offerings was. And that's in, um, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. His his offering was by faith. And Cain's wasn't. Well, you say, well, how do we know somebody's offering is by faith or for 
some other reason. Well, you probably don't, but God does. That's why we don't need to run around concerning ourselves with whether or not the service that is performed by somebody, the money that they give or whatever is given with the right attitude, with the right heart. You know, we don't know that. We can't see the heart. God, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Uh, is what God said uh, to Samuel when he was choosing the person that would be the king, one of Jesse's sons, who would be the next king in place of Saul. And Samuel thought it would be this guy or this guy or this guy. And God and Samuel, God said to Samuel, no, no, no. Man looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. So it's not the idea of us knowing for sure what somebody else is doing, whether it's by faith or not. But God knows, and God knew that Cain did not have a heart of faith toward God, and that Abel did. That we know for sure. There's a difference in the sacrifice there. So Cain did not do well when it came to his offering, his sacrifice. And uh, and then Cain did not do well in his reaction to God's not receiving his offering. His reaction was not good. He got angry. He got very angry. He's not humble. If you do well, will you not be accepted? If you do not do well, sin lies at the door. We want to blame everything on somebody else. Let's remember to go back to who did it. Let's remember to accept the fact that we are guilty of this or that, and we need to deal with it. If we humble ourselves, if Cain had said, you know, I'm sorry, Lord. Uh, I'm wrong. I didn't bring you the bad. I didn't bring you the birds. I ate it. You know? And uh, if he didn't have that humble heart, but instead, pride, blaming somebody else, anger, it's my brother. I'm envious of my brother. My brother's teacher, Pat. Blah, blah, blah. Well, there's a reason why your brother's teaching Pat, you know. <clears throat> We're always pointing the finger at somebody else, but we just need to be concerned about where we are. And, and Cain didn't do a good job of reacting to God's rejection. Instead of looking at it factually, he just got defensive, as we often do. The humble heart even when that person hasn't done anything wrong, is still going to take a humble approach. And that's where it really gets difficult. Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Messiah, the promised one, God in the flesh. When he was dying on the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Stephen, the first deep, one of the first deacons and the first martyr of the church, when he was being stoned to death, said, lay not this sin to their charge as the last words he spoke. So even somebody who is wrong or being treated wrongly like that, God expects us to love our enemies. God expects us to take it humbly. And boy, is that tough. Woo! But first of all, we have to come to the point where we realize that okay, that is the way that God says it's supposed to be done. And it's completely against everything that our feelings say to us. And that is what Jesus is talking about here. But Cain was not humble about the whole thing. And uh, he was proud, envious, anger, bitter, unforgiving. But see, unforgiveness and bitterness and hatred is like 
acid in a container. It eats the container that it's in. And you're the container that the acid of hatred and bitterness and unforgiveness is in. And it's eating you up from the inside out. We can't hold on to it. Why would we when it's doing that to us? Cain actually was angry with God but he, he couldn't murder God. Finally, God sent his son to become flesh, become murderable, and then we went ahead and did it. Cain wanted to kill God a long time before. Finally, man put Jesus to death on the cross when he got the chance. Cain was angry at God. How foolish it is to be angry at God. Listen to this. Being angry at God is as crazy as a little child so furious at his loving parents for not letting him drink poison that he runs away from home having no conception of the dangers and deprivation he is exposing himself to. That's us. We understand infinite intelligence no more than a baby can understand his mother's decisions. Being angry at God is as crazy as being angry at a doctor for diagnosing your lump as cancerous and wanting to treat it. It's as crazy as a drowning man fighting off his rescuer. Arrogantly assuming we know the end of the story when we are still on page one. We blindly jump to conclusions when we only know a fraction of the facts and get things so wrong that we end up blaming the one person who is utterly in innocent, treating as sadistic torturer, the only person who cares enough to tend our wounds, accusing of callousness, the only one so moved by our plight that he weeps in secret. It's like despising the person who has given us both of his kidneys and instigating a hate campaign against the sweetest person in the universe. <clears throat> That's what being mad at God is like. Completely foolish. But Cain was angry at God. Cain didn't do well with his offering. He didn't do well with his reaction to God's rejection of his offering. And he did not do well with his new opportunity to do well. Because he had a second chance, you know, and God is the author of second chances. And yet, many people don't take advantage of their opportunity, the second chance. Instead of taking the opportunity of the second chance with regard to his offering, what did he do? Well, he killed his brother. And God came to him, verse 10. The Lord said, Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? No, you're your brother's killer. You should be your brother's keeper. And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth and received your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. When he didn't take advantage of his second chance, sin, which was lying at wait, and that's what God had warned him about, that if you, you keep this bitter attitude, you keep this unforgiveness, sin is just lying at the door, ready to pounce on you, ready to take over your life, ready to get you into all kinds of trouble. And sure enough, it pounced on him, and he ended up murdering his brother. He ended up piling more curses on him. They'd already been cursed from the garden, and now he won't even be able to have the riches of the land in the form of fruit. It's dangerous to be a, an angry, bitter person. Hebrews 12, 15 
looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Because we're supposed to look out for each other with regard to this and try to help each other with regard to this because it is not something that will just destroy that person, but it will destroy the people around that person. The bitterness, the poison will have its effect on other people. When I was uh, a youth pastor in New York for a while years ago, there was a young man in the youth group named Scott Dillenbeck. And Scott would, would come to church, um, and he made a profession of faith. Um, but then he started hanging around with an angry person, a bitter person. And one day he was with that bitter, angry person when that bitter, angry person murdered a guy. And Scott was with him. And so Scott spent decades in prison because he was just hanging around with an angry person and became an accomplice to a murder that way. Proverbs 22, 24. Make no friendship with an angry man or with a furious man. Do not go. The poison is spewing and you're liable to end up with it all over you. <coughs> Cain, anger, hatred, and murder. If you feel hatred welling up in you, don't, don't look so innocent out there. <laughs> you know, this person's hurt you and hurt you badly. I mean, deep, cut it deep. And, and you just are so angry. That you feel hatred coming up in you. The moment you feel that, you had better get on your knees and ask God to forgive you. And you had better forgive that person from your heart. For your own good, you gotta get, you know, there is a root of hatred and bitterness coming up inside of you. And you gotta grab a hold of that thing and rip it out and cast it away before it destroys you and destroys the people around you. This isn't one of those things where you don't forgive the person. Like, oh, they don't deserve it. Has nothing to do with that. It has to do with you keeping from destroying yourself. The root of hatred and poison that's rising up inside of you. <coughs> A fellow named Stephen McDonald, a young police officer in 1986, was shot by a teenager in New York Central Park, and it left this police officer paralyzed. And this is what he said. He said, I forgave the shooter because I believe the only thing worse than receiving a bullet in my spine would have been to nurture revenge in my heart. He understood that he was doing something for himself when he rooted out that hatred and that bitterness and holding on to it would, would destroy him. Mary Jansen, her teenage son, was at a party, got in a fight with a guy, and the guy shot him to death. Her teenage boy, and this guy killed him. And she hated that teenager that shot him. And she was filled with bitterness. But finally, about 12 years later, she went to the jail to confront this guy and try to find out some more about what happened. And she said, after this first contact, 